The Voice of Russia World Service presents another program in the series The Christian Message from Moscow. Today we present an extract from the dialogue between the great Russian saint Serafim of Sarov and his spiritual son, a hereditary nobleman, landowner and judge, Nikolai Motovilov. This dialogue took place in the winter of 1831 in the monastery near the town of Sarov in central Russia. In the piece you will hear now, Saint Seraphim tells Nikolai Motovilov about the grace of the Holy Spirit. And then the saint demonstrates to his spiritual son the fullness of the Spirit of God. This talk is a unique evidence of the Orthodox faith. How can I know that I am in the grace of the Holy Spirit? It is very simple, your godliness. That is why the Lord says, All things are simple to those who find knowledge. The trouble is that we do not seek this divine knowledge which does not puff off, for it is not of this world. This knowledge, which is full of love for God and for our neighbor, builds up every man for his salvation. Of this knowledge, the Lord said that God wills all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And of the lack of this knowledge, he said to his apostles, Are you also without understanding? Or have ye not read the scriptures? Or did ye not understand this parable? Concerning this understanding, it is said in the gospel of the apostles, then opened he their understanding, and the apostles also perceived whether the Spirit of God was dwelling in them or not. And being filled with understanding, they saw the presence of the Holy Spirit with them and declared positively that their work was holy and entirely pleasing to the Lord God. That explains why in their epistles they wrote, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us. Only on these grounds did they offer their epistles as immutable truth for the benefit of all the faithful. Thus the holy apostles were consciously aware of the presence in themselves of the Spirit of God. And so you see, your godliness, how simple it is. Nevertheless, I do not understand how I can be certain that I am in the Spirit of God. How can I discern for myself his true manifestation in me? I have already told you, your godliness, that it is very simple. And I have related in detail how people come to be in the Spirit of God, and how we can recognize His presence in us. So, what do you want, my dear? I want to understand it well. Father Seraphim took me very firmly by the shoulders and said, We are both in the Spirit of God now, my dear. Why don't you look at me? I cannot look, Father, because your eyes are flashing like lightning. Your face has become brighter than the sun, and my eyes ache with pain. Don't be alarmed, your godliness. Now, you yourself have become as bright as I am. You are now in the fullness of the Spirit of God yourself. Otherwise, 
you would not be able to see me as I am. Then, bending his head towards me, he whispered softly in my ear, Thank the Lord God for his unutterable mercy to us. You saw that I did not even cross myself, and only in my heart I prayed mentally to the Lord God and said within myself, Lord, grant him to see clearly with his bodily eyes that descent of thy spirit which thou grantest to thy servants when thou art pleased to appear in the light of thy magnificent glory. And you see, my dear, the Lord instantly fulfilled the humble prayer of poor Seraphim. How then shall we not thank him for his unspeakable gift to us both? Even to the greatest hermits, my dear, the Lord God does not always show his mercy in this way. This grace of God, like a loving mother, has been pleased to comfort your contrite heart at the intercession of the Mother of God herself. But why, my dear, do you not look me in the eyes? Just look, and don't be afraid. The Lord is with us. After these words, I glanced at his face, and there came over me an even greater reverent awe. Imagine, in the center of the sun, in the dazzling light of its midday rays, the face of a man talking to you. You see the movement of his lips and the changing expression of his eyes. You hear his voice. You feel someone holding your shoulders, Yet you do not see his hands, you do not even see yourself or his figure, but only a blinding light spreading far around for several yards and illumining with its glaring sheen both the snow blanket which covered the forest glade and the snowflakes which besprinkled me and the great elder. You can imagine the state I was in. How do you feel now? extraordinarily well. But in what way? How exactly do you feel well? I feel such calmness and peace in my soul that no words can express it. This, your godliness, is that peace of which the Lord said to his disciples, My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And to those people whom this world hates, but who are chosen by the Lord, the Lord gives that peace which you now feel within you, the peace which, in the words of the apostles, passes all understanding. The Apostle describes it in this way because it is impossible to express in words the spiritual well-being which it produces in those into whose hearts the Lord God has infused it. Christ the Savior calls it a peace which comes from his own generosity and is not of this world, for no temporary earthly prosperity can give it to the human heart. It is granted from on high by the Lord God himself, and that is why it is called the peace of God. What else do you feel? This is that sweetness of which it is said in Holy Scripture, they will be inebriated with the fatness of thy house and thou shalt make them drink of the torrent of thy light. And now this sweetness is flooding our hearts and coursing through our veins with unutterable delight. From this sweetness our hearts melt, as it were, and both of us are filled with such happiness as tongue cannot tell. 
What else do you feel? An extraordinary sweetness. When the Spirit of God comes down to man and overshadows him with the fullness of his inspiration, then the human soul overflows with unspeakable joy, for the Spirit of God fills with joy whatever he touches. This is that joy of which the Lord speaks in his gospel. A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour is come. But when she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. In the world you'll be sorrowful, but when I see you again, your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. Yet however comforting may be this joy which you now feel in your heart, it is nothing in comparison with that of which the Lord himself by the mouth of his apostle said that that joy I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him. Foretastes of that joy are given to us now, and if they fill our souls with such sweetness, well-being, and happiness. What shall we say of that joy which has been prepared in heaven for those who weep here on earth? And you, my dear, have wept enough in our life on earth. Yet see, with what joy the Lord consoles you even in this life. Now it is up to us, my dear, to add labors to labors in order to go from strength to strength and to come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that the words of the Lord may be fulfilled in us. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall grow wings like eagles and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They will go from strength to strength, and the God of gods will appear to them in the scion of realization and heavenly visions. Only then will our present joy, which now visits us little and briefly, appear in all its fullness, and no one will take it from us, for we shall be filled to overflowing with inexplicable heavenly delights. What else do you feel, your godliness? An extraordinary joy in all my heart. An extraordinary warmth. How can you feel warmth, my dear? Look, we are sitting in the forest. It is winter out of doors, and snow is underfoot. There's more than an inch of snow on us, and the snowflakes are still falling. What warmth can there be? Such as there is in a bathhouse, when the water is poured on the stone, and the steam rises in clouds. And the smell? Is it the same as in a bathhouse? No. There is nothing on earth like this fragrance. When in my dear mother's lifetime I was fond of dancing and used to go to balls and parties, my mother would sprinkle me with the scent which she bought at the best fashion shops in Kazan. But those scents did not exhale such a fragrance. <laughs> I know it myself just as well as you do, my dear. But I'm asking you on purpose to see whether you feel it in the same way. It is absolutely true, your godliness. The sweetest earthly fragrance cannot be compared with the fragrance which we now feel, for we are now enveloped in the fragrance of the Holy Spirit of God. What on earth can be like it? Mark your godliness. You have told me that Around us, it is warm 
as in the bathhouse. But look, neither on you nor me does the snow melt, nor does it underfoot. Therefore, this warmth is not in the air, but in us. It is that very warmth about which the Holy Spirit, in the words of prayer, makes us cry to the Lord, Warm me with the warmth of thy Holy Spirit. By it the hermits of both sexes were kept warm and did not fear the winter frost, being clad as in fur coats, in their grace-given clothing woven by the Holy Spirit. And so it must be in actual fact, for the grace of God must dwell within us, in our heart, because the Lord said, the kingdom of God is within you. By the kingdom of God, the Lord meant the grace of the Holy Spirit. This kingdom of God is now within us, and the grace of the Holy Spirit shines upon and warms us from without as well. It fills the surrounding air with many fragrant odors, sweetens our senses with heavenly delight, and floods our hearts with unutterable joy. Our present state is that of which the Apostle says, The kingdom of God is not food or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Our faith consists not in the plausible words of earthly wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power. That is just the state we are in now. Of this state, the Lord said, There are some of those standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come in power. See, your godliness. What unspeakable joy the Lord God has now granted us. This is what it means to be in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. About this, St. Macarius of Egypt writes, I myself was in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. With this fullness of His Holy Spirit, the Lord has now filled us, poor creatures, to overflowing. So there is no need now, your godliness to ask how people come to be in the grace of the Holy Spirit. Will you be able to remember the present manifestation of God's ineffable mercy which has visited us? I don't know, Father, whether the Lord will grant me to remember this mercy of God always as vividly and clearly as I feel it now. I think that the Lord will help you to retain it in your memory forever, or His goodness would never have instantly bowed in this way to my humble prayer and so quickly anticipated the request of poor Seraphim. All the more so because it is not given to you alone to understand it, but through you it is for the whole world in order that you yourself may be confirmed in God's work and may be useful to others. The fact that I am a monk and you are a layman is utterly beside the point. What God requires is true faith in Himself and His only begotten Son. In return for that, the grace of the Holy Spirit is granted abundantly from on high.
You've heard an extract from the dialogue between the great Russian saint Serafim of Sarov and his spiritual son Nikolai Motovilov. The talk took place in the winter of 1831. In case you found the story interesting, you may read it in full in the book Little Russian Philokalia, Volume 1, Saint Seraphim of Sarov, printed by Nuvala Monastery, Alaska, St. Herman Press, in 1991. This book is a good source of information about Russian Orthodoxy. If you have any questions, please feel free to write us, and we will try to answer them. Be with us in a week's time to hear another program in the series The Christian Message from Moscow.